In this video, we're leveling up from individual neurons to multi-layer neural networks. My aim is to give you an idea of how neural networks compute their predictions, and why we would even prefer a network over a single neuron. Every node in a neural net performs the same computation we've seen before, which we can split into two stages taking the weighted sum of inputs and applying an activation function. Only now, a neuron's input can come from previous neuron's activations, and the activation it computes can be passed along as input to later nodes. In the case of neuron 8 in this network, it receives its inputs from neurons 5, 6, and 7. So the weighted sum of inputs that neuron 8 performs adds up the activations of those neurons times the weights on the corresponding edges plus the bias. So our sum is over activations 5, 6, and 7 times respectively the weights from 5 to 8, 6 to 8, and 7 to 8. Then, as always, that weighted sum of inputs is passed through the activation function for node 8. And then this output from neuron 8 is fed in as one of the inputs to nodes 11 and 12. For this activation function, we saw with single neuron models that if the output was linear, we could use the model for regression, and if the output was a sigmoid activation, we could use the model for classification. But now that we have many neurons in our network that are not directly producing the output of the model, it can be very useful to have some additional activation functions at our disposal. And two of the most common additional activation functions are the hyperbolic tangent, which behaves much like the sigmoid smoothly approximating a step function, but in this case the outputs range from minus 1 to 1 instead of just 0 to 1. And also we have the rectifier linear unit, which behaves like a linear activation function when its input is positive, but if the weighted sum of inputs is negative, the neuron will output 0. And because we will eventually be training our neural networks with gradient descent, we need to know the derivative of each of these activation functions. And for each of these functions, I've formulated the derivative in terms of the activation that the function outputs. We could also write down the derivative in terms of the input, but as we'll see when we derive gradient descent, we'll need to be storing the activations anyway, and so if we can formulate the derivative in terms of those stored activations, we can make our computations easier. So now we want to think about how do we actually perform a computation using a neural network to make a prediction on some data point. Well, we begin by using the data point to set the activations of the input layer to the network. These nodes I've illustrated in the input layer aren't really neurons. They're not computing anything. Instead, they are just storing the values in the input vector. All of the subsequent nodes in the hidden layers and the output layer are neurons performing this sort of computation. Because the job of these input nodes is just to store the point on which we're making a prediction, the dimension of our data directly determines the number of inputs to our network. So the network I have drawn is one that operates on four-dimensional inputs. Likewise, because we have two output nodes, we know that this network produces two-dimensional outputs, and so this network would be used for making predictions on a data set with four-dimensional observations and two-dimensional targets. So the size of the input and output layers are part of our hypothesis space specification, 
But as we'll see, the complexity of function that the network can represent will depend on the number and connectivity of nodes and layers between the inputs and outputs. These neurons in between are known as hidden neurons, and they are typically organized into layers. The layer structure means that if we compute all of the activations for one layer, then we know that all of the inputs for the next layer are now available. And so we'll often describe our neural networks in terms of the number and size of hidden layers. In this case, we have two hidden layers that each contain three neurons. So to compute a prediction with this neural network, we start by setting the activation of the input layer neurons equal to the components of some data point. Then we will loop through the layers of the network, and at each layer, we will compute each neuron's activation. As we know, that computation does a weighted sum of inputs and then applies an activation function. And along the way, we will store the activation that each neuron computes because when we get to the next layer, we will need to reference the previous activations to compute our weighted sum of inputs. And it turns out we'll also need those activations when we're performing gradient descent to update the weights. So with a network like this one, we can map our four-dimensional inputs to two-dimensional outputs. But why is that any better than just using two single neuron models to produce the two outputs? In other words, what's the benefit of messing around with these hidden layers? Well, it turns out that if we use linear activations for all of our neurons, there's actually no benefit at all. And the reason that hidden layers don't help if we only use linear neurons comes from a theorem you may have seen in linear algebra. If we have two functions that are both linear, and we compose those functions, the result is another linear function. And so if we compute some linear function with this neuron and then pass it through some other linear function, we could have achieved the same thing by just using different weights on a single neuron. I have not stated this theorem particularly carefully, and I'm not going to prove it. But the consequence is that if we want to get any value out of multilayer networks, we need to use some nonlinear activation function. But then the question becomes how much can we represent if we use nonlinear activations? Well, if we think back to our single neuron models with sigmoid activations, we used the sigmoid activation because it approximated a Boolean step function. And if we go back to that simplification and think about a step function outputting zero or one, we can think about what Boolean functions can be computed. And this leads us to a second theorem that you may have encountered in a class that covers Boolean logic which is that if we can build and, or, and not, and then compose them together, we can represent any Boolean function. And because computers are built using Boolean logic, any Boolean function really means any function we could possibly compute. Once again, I'm not going to prove this theorem, but I do want to show you how we could make neurons that represent and, or, and not. If we plot the and function on the plane that shows x1 versus x2, there are four possible inputs, the combinations of 0 or 1 for x1 or x2, and the and function outputs a 1 if its inputs are both 1, and otherwise it outputs zero. 
So how could we build a neuron that computes this function? Well, a step function classifier will split the plane into a region where it outputs 0 and a region where it outputs 1. So let's choose the weights that put the decision boundary here. And to get this decision boundary, we can use the following weights. If the weights on x1 and x2 are both 1, and the bias is negative 1 and a half, then the only way for the weighted sum of inputs to be positive is when x1 and x2 are both 1, and otherwise the neuron will output 0. Likewise, for the OR function, we can represent that on the 2D plane, but now if either or both of the inputs is 1, we output a 1, and for this we can construct a very similar neuron. Our decision boundary has just moved down by 1, and so we get weights of 1 and 1, and a bias of negative a half. For negation, we can think of it as a function that takes one input, so we only have a one-dimensional classifier. And here we want to put our decision boundary at 0.5, and we want to output 0 if we're above the boundary, and 1 if we're below it. With a weight of negative 1, our step function neuron would have a negative sum of inputs for 1, and a zero sum of inputs for 0, and with the threshold at minus 0 0.5, it will output 1 if the input is 0, and 0 if the input is 1. So if we were using a step function for our activation, then we could build neurons that represent and or a not, and since the sigmoid approximates the step function, we could use it to approximate and or a not. And so in principle, by chaining together neurons that represent and or a not, we could build a neural network that corresponds to a circuit to compute just about any function. And while there are some very old research papers that think about neural networks by analogy to circuits, None of the neural networks that I've been drawing, or that you're likely to see, look at all like a Boolean circuit. And that's because when using neural networks, we don't actually want to design circuits by hand. Instead, we want to train our neural networks using gradient descent. And for that, it turns out that a great tool is a neural network architecture consisting of multiple layers of nodes, that are each densely connected to the next. So from here, we'd like to use gradient descent on some data set to train the parameters of the neural network so that it represents some interesting function. When we had a single neuron, our parameters were the weights and the bias. And now that we have a network composed of many neurons, the model's parameters are all of the weights and all of the biases in the entire network. So if we were to write down the parameter vector for this neural network, it would contain the weight from neuron 1 to neuron 5, and from neuron 1 to neuron 6, and so on for all of the weights, and it would contain the bias for every single node. So in total, we have 4 times 3, plus 3 times 3, plus 3 times 2 weights in the network, and we have 3 plus 3 plus 2 biases, meaning that in total this network has 35 parameters. And when we compute gradients, we will have a partial derivative for each of those parameters. But those partial derivatives are defined based on the loss function, and so we need to think about what is the loss function when we have a neural network with multiple output neurons. In a single neuron model, we had a loss function that depended on the neuron's activation and the target. But now we need a loss function that incorporates the activation and the target for every neuron in the output layer. The first approach we'll consider for this is to generalize the mean squared error for a single neuron by simply summing over all the output neurons.
So for any point j in the data set, the loss of the model on that point is the sum over the output neurons of the square difference between the target and the activation. And note here that I'm using the subscripts to refer to which neuron we're talking about, and the superscripts to refer to some point in the data set. To get the loss for the data set, we want to take the mean of these squared errors for all of the points. So with this definition of the loss on the data set, we can compute the gradient of the loss evaluated at the current parameters, then take a step in the minus gradient direction to update all of the weights and the biases in a way that reduces the loss of the network. When we do this repeatedly, we'll be performing gradient descent. And in the next video, we'll go into much more detail on the backpropagation algorithm for performing gradient descent updates on a neural network.